Welcome everyone, I'm your host, Emerson Green. So I have two main goals today. First, I want to help you become more conversant in metaethics. So in listening, you'll gain some basic tools for being a part of the conversation that you would not have been equipped with if you'd only listened to the mainstream apologetics discourse about moral arguments for God. Second, I want to explain why I think the standard moral argument for God is a complete and utter failure. One thing I'm not doing today is offering a comprehensive defense of moral realism. Moral objectivity without God comes up quite a lot, as you can imagine, and you'll have a much better understanding of moral realism and why a lot of atheists defend it by listening to this. But this is not all aimed at giving the case for moral realism. The main purpose is clarifying metaethical issues that frequently come up in the apologetics discourse, correcting common mistakes, and in the process, explaining why the standard moral argument doesn't work. The unifying theme here is the way mainstream apologetics has completely failed the people who look to it to understand the issues we're discussing today. beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and morality. So imagine God standing prior to the moment of creation. He thinks to himself, Oh yeah, I need to make the moral law. Even though no one exists yet, he sees in his vast knowledge some of the things that will eventually come to pass within his creation. Torture. Hmm. Should I command or forbid that? Let's see. Impermissible, permissible, or obligatory. Uh, uh, Does anyone have a coin? Or maybe one of those magic eight ball things that can shake up? Obviously, it seems absurd that God would choose what's commanded or forbidden arbitrarily, that there would be no reason that he chose to forbid murder and theft instead of commanding them. Surely, he had a reason. And those are the two options, right? He either had no reason, which is what I mean by arbitrary, or he had a reason. Those options are exhaustive. He either had a reason, or he didn't have a reason. In that hypothetical moment prior to creation, as he thought about acts of murder, theft, rape, and torture, vividly and perfectly understanding their every feature, he could see that those things were wrong. He commanded us not to commit those acts because they're wrong. The nature of merciless torture the features of the act itself, are directly responsible for its moral status. God, for all his great power, could not have imposed any moral truth whatsoever upon the act of brutal torture, just as he was not free to impose any mathematical or logical structure whatsoever upon the world. At least, that's why my hypothetical creation account in which God flips a coin to decide whether certain acts will be commanded or forbidden seems so absurd to me. God did not issue his commands arbitrarily, nor would the opposite commands have rendered murder, theft, rape, and torture morally good. It's not God's say-so that makes actions right or wrong. Rather, God says so because he can see what's good and bad about these acts, and because he's wise, all-knowing, loving, and so on. In other words, if God exists, he did have moral reasons for issuing his commands. An astounding number of people are inclined to think differently. They think that morality is objective only if God exists. Without a divine moral lawgiver, there would be no objective moral truths. But clearly there are objective moral truths, so with those premises in hand, we have an argument for God, one of the most popular ones in existence. If you're like me, then you accept one of those premises, the one about the reality of moral truths, but you reject the other premise about God being required for moral objectivity. But moral anti-realists should also be able to see the issues I'll raise with the idea that objective morality must be grounded in God, or even can be grounded in God. So my radical claim is that in order for something to be wrong, like torturing a baby, we don't need to find out whether God exists first. We can just see that it's wrong to torture a baby without stopping like, wait a second, does God exist? Because I can't really decide whether it's good or bad or neither good nor bad to torture a baby until we answer the question about God first. Even if God exists, he did not have to create moral truth. 
He's not the author of the moral law any more than he'd be the author of laws of logic. As philosopher Michael Humer once put it, if the universe has a creator, this fact could have nothing to do with objective morality, and the absence of a creator poses no problem for objective morality. Plenty of apologists make extremely confident assertions about this or that following logically from atheism. Nihilism is entailed by atheism, subjectivism is entailed by atheism, etc. Or somehow even more irritatingly, the more honest atheist will admit that, insert terrible meta-ethical view, follows from atheism. However, atheism would only entail a particular meta-ethical view if it were incompatible with all other meta-ethical positions, like moral non-naturalism and moral naturalism, subjectivism, non-cognitivism, and error theory. But atheism isn't incompatible with any of those, so atheism doesn't entail any meta-ethical view. So atheism doesn't entail nihilism, or whatever. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, then you are really not in a position to be making the moral argument. And yes, I am calling out virtually every apologist who makes the moral argument with that. A great deal of people who rely on apologetics are genuinely unaware that most philosophers are moral realists. In fact, the majority of atheist philosophers are moral realists, and that defenses of robust moral objectivity have been offered that make no reference to God. In fact, most of them make no reference to God. The influence of Christian apologists has been detrimental to the understanding of philosophy in this area, which is the main reason I wanted to talk about this. The moral argument, one of the most popular arguments for God in the modern age, depends entirely on meta-ethics. Yet most Christian apologists who write books, give talks, make videos, and podcasts are stunningly ignorant of the basics. As Christian philosopher Kenny Pierce once said on Twitter, I am once again begging, nay, imploring, people who want to use meta-ethics for apologetics to learn literally anything about meta-ethics. So I'm not just dunking on Christian apologetics here. I'm not just doing that. I want to raise the level of discourse, because right now it sucks. And to be honest, I'm a little put off that I was so misled by Christian apologists on this topic. I wasted a lot of time lost in the useless dialectic between apologists and counter-apologists spawned by the moral argument. And I don't want anyone else to get sucked into the black hole of confusion sustained in existence by apologists and the unfortunate souls who only know about meta-ethics through them. Let's define some crucial terms and get this out of the way before we move forward. First, meta-ethics. In Applied Ethics, an Impartial Introduction, the authors distinguish between three areas of moral philosophy, applied ethics, normative ethics, and meta-ethics. Quote, applied ethics tries to give answers to the practical moral questions we ask in everyday life. For example, is abortion wrong? Is polluting the environment permissible? Do animals have rights? Normative ethics is more abstract than applied ethics. Normative ethics tries to construct theories that account for the rightness or wrongness of certain actions, motives, and or character traits. For example, what makes both murder and stealing wrong? Is there a common ingredient to their wrongness? Can we tell a simple story about why they are both wrong? Meta-ethics is about even more abstract questions than is normative ethics. Meta-ethics tries to answer fundamental questions about the nature of morality. For example, what are goodness and badness? Are right and wrong real and objective? Are they based on emotions, or are they entirely made up? Are we capable of knowing what is good and bad? If so, how? End quote. Next, descriptive versus evaluative. Descriptive facts are value-free. For example, water is two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. Evaluative facts, or normative facts, involve a positive or negative evaluation. For example, suffering is bad. It may be a descriptive fact that John is in pain, but it doesn't follow automatically that it's a bad thing that John is in pain, that we ought not inflict pain on John, that John has reason to avoid pain. Propositions that include terms like should or ought or otherwise involve assessing something as good or bad are outside the category of value-free descriptive statements. 
Pretty much everyone agrees that descriptive statements can be objectively true or false. There is a fact of the matter whether water is two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen, but not everyone agrees that there are also evaluative statements that can be objectively true or false. There are some evaluative judgments that don't have anything to do with morality. For example, aesthetics and epistemology both involve evaluating things and assigning positive or negative properties. Art can be beautiful. A theory can be unjustified. We believe that logical consistency is better than logical inconsistency. All those statements involve positive or negative evaluations, even though they don't have anything to do with morality. Can art be objectively beautiful? Most people don't seem to think so. Are there epistemic norms like one ought to be logically consistent? Most people do seem to think so. It may be a descriptive fact that a person is being logically inconsistent, but most people additionally think there's something bad about being logically inconsistent, that we should not be logically inconsistent, that we have reason to be logically consistent. So not all proposed evaluative facts are about morality. Next, objective morality. By objective morality, I mean there are truths about what's good and bad, right and wrong, which are true independently of the attitudes, opinions, reactions, etc. of observers. There are not only descriptive facts, but evaluative facts as well, like suffering is bad, and it's wrong to torture infants. These propositions are true, and they're true regardless of what I think about it, or what anyone else thinks about it. They are objective facts. According to William Fitzpatrick, Ethical realism begins with the plausible idea that we use ethical language to make claims that can be straightforwardly true or false. The minimal core characterization of ethical realism, according to Fitzpatrick, is roughly that ethical sentences, like wanton cruelty is morally wrong, express propositions that can be straightforwardly true or false, just as with ordinary descriptive sentences. And at least some positive ethical sentences, and the propositions expressed by them, are in fact true and straightforwardly so, in the way ordinary descriptive propositions are straightforwardly true. That's the core of moral realism. At least some positive ethical propositions are straightforwardly true. So consider two objective but descriptive facts. First, the Earth is not flat. It's an oblate spheroid. Second, seven is greater than two. They're both non-evaluative facts that obtain regardless of what anyone thinks about them, whether they want them to be true, etc. We know about those quite differently, and in some sense they seem like different kinds of facts altogether, even though they're both objectively true. The Earth is an oblate spheroid, and 7 is greater than 2. And as you can probably guess, I'm trying to establish a precedent. A. Objective facts can fall into different categories. For example, they're not all about the physical world or some such. And B. We can know about objective facts through very different means. The way that we know 7 is greater than 2 is not the same as the way we know that the Earth is an oblate spheroid. The broad category of objective facts is not monolithic. They don't all seem to be the same kinds of facts, and we don't all know about them in the same way. As a side note, consider how strange it would be to object at this point and say, yes, but where do these facts come from? That would seem like a poorly formed question, and there is no good answer to a poorly formed question. Just try to rephrase your thought to cut more to the heart of the matter if you want to start a fruitful dialogue. So we mentioned two objective facts that we know about quite differently, but obviously not everything is objective. For example, excitingness is subjective. Whether a movie is exciting or boring depends on how you react to it. To say a movie is boring just means that it tends to produce boredom in those who watch it. That is, facts about our reaction to the movie constitute the property of being boring or being exciting. Moral realists think moral truths are more like 7 being greater than 2, and less like whether a movie is exciting. So, to address one common point of confusion, moral objectivity does not mean facts about what causes suffering or what will lead to flourishing. Those are just descriptive facts. It may be objectively true that X or Y will lead to more suffering, but there's still no evaluation that it would be good to take the course that will lead to less suffering, all else equal. That would have to be a separate, non-descriptive fact. Next, subjective morality. Roughly, subjective indicates some kind of dependence on a mind or minds, or a person or persons. 
But there's some confusion around the meaning of subjective in this context, so before going further, I'm going to take a minute to explain why it's not defined certain ways. Some people think that moral truths are crucially linked to facts about pain and pleasure, or the experiences of conscious creatures more broadly, and I'm not saying that's a mistake. Rather, it's a mistake to think that moral subjectivism is the view that morality is really just about the experiences of conscious subjects. So to see why, consider hedonism. In normative ethics, hedonism is the view that I was just beginning to describe, and the view described by Jeremy Bentham in the opening words of one of his books. Quote, Nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. It is for them alone to point out what we ought to do, as well as to determine what we shall do. End quote. When Bentham asserts that pain and pleasure alone dictate what we ought to do, is he additionally making the claim that this is objectively true? Well, we don't know yet. He hasn't said one way or the other at this point. A consistent hedonist could either maintain that there are objective, evaluative facts, facts that obtain regardless of what anyone thinks about them, or they could reject the existence of such stance-independent, evaluative facts. So, right off the bat, this seems like a bad way to define subjectivism. Moreover, it doesn't follow from moral subjectivism that one must be a hedonist. You could be a subjectivist, who rejects hedonism in favor of virtue ethics or rule consequentialism. Or you could be a hedonist who rejects moral subjectivism. Plenty of hedonic act utilitarians are passionate moral realists. The idea that moral subjectivism means morality comes down to the experiences of conscious creatures is just totally confused. On that account, there isn't adequate conceptual space for the subjectivist who rejects hedonism or for the hedonist who rejects moral subjectivism. So given the coherence of these options, Subjectivism should be defined differently in the metaethical taxonomy. And in philosophy, it is defined differently. I mean, this isn't like an area of controversy, I'm just addressing a common point of confusion here. In his book, Ethical Intuitionism, Michael Humer defines subjective as constitutive dependence. Moral subjectivism, quote, holds that moral properties are subjective in the following sense. For a thing to be good is for some individual or group to be disposed to take some attitude towards it. The simplest form of subjectivism states that X is good means I approve of X. Notice that since on this analysis, good applies to whatever the speaker approves of, one could truthfully say polygamy is good, while another truthfully says polygamy is not good. Their statements do not logically conflict any more than if the first had said, I like pickles, and the other had said, I don't like pickles. Other forms of subjectivism substitute other attitudes for approval, and other persons or groups for the speaker. End quote. So we should distinguish between constitutive and causal dependence. Causal dependence is relatively straightforward. A kitten causally depends on the procreative act of its parents. If A causes B, then B causally depends on A. Constitutive dependence is a little different. If we say a movie is boring, that's because the movie tends to elicit a certain reaction from observers. For subjectivists, Morality is made of the attitudes, opinions, dispositions, reactions, approval slash disapproval, etc., of an individual or groups of individuals. Straightforward examples of constitutive dependence include the properties of being funny, or sexually attractive, or boring, or exciting, and so on. As Humor explains, a subjective property is one that is at least partially constituted by its tendency to elicit a certain reaction from observers. In other words, if f-ness is subjective, then part of what it is for a thing to be f is for observers to have, or be disposed to have, some particular sort of reaction to it. So there's no contradiction between my finding a movie boring and you finding it riveting. Boringness and rivetingness constitutively depend on subjects like us, that is, certain attitudes, opinions, dispositions, etc., of a subject constitute what boringness is. There's nothing objective about it. Oh, you think that's exciting? I'm afraid you're incorrect. No, it's dependent on, at least partly, in fact, constituted by, your reaction. Oh, you think she's attractive? Well, that's correct. Good job. No, these things are subjective. A moral subjectivist thinks goodness is a lot like being exciting, or being attractive, or being funny. Moral realists, on the other hand, reject subjectivism along with other forms of moral anti-realism. There are truths about what is good and bad, right and wrong, which are true independently of what anyone thinks about it. 
Next, the meta-ethical landscape. Joe Schmid created a helpful flowchart based on the work of Michael Humer to help understand the basic shape of the meta-ethical landscape. So for a quick survey of the general meta-ethical positions that are out there, here's a clip from The Majesty of Reason. So then what is moral realism? So I think it's helpful to think of moral realism like a branching structure of questions and answers to those questions. So the first question at the top of the branching structure, and I'll actually put, I'll put on the screen a little picture of this branching structure so people can follow along from home. But the first question is, do our moral judgments express propositions? Uh, or I guess more conservatively, do at least some of our moral judgments express propositions? Perhaps we don't want to get into all the empirical details about what all of us mean by all of our moral judgments, especially across time and societies and so on. So we can just ask, do some of our moral judgments express propositions? That is, are they truth act? Can they be true or false? Can they have truth values? If you say no, you've got a non-cognitivist view. And if you say yes, you've got a cognitivist view. Now, under cognitivism, we have further divisions. So we can ask, are some of those moral judgments true? If you say no, none of those moral judgments are true, then you've got an error theory or moral error theory, sometimes called moral nihilism. It just says that all of our moral judgments are systematically in error. They're all systematically false. None of them are true. By contrast, if you say yes to that question, are some of those moral judgments true? You then ask the final question, is their truth value stance independent? That is, does their truth or falsity depend on us collectively or individually taking certain stances toward the world or toward certain propositions? So for instance, do they depend on our desires or our beliefs or uh, our collective values or our individual values uh, or other sorts of attitudes? If you say no, then you have subjectivism or relativism or various other forms of anti-realism. And if you say yes, then you have a more realist view. The last term I want to define is apologist, since I'm using it pejoratively. In some sense, we're all apologists for whatever view we defend. When I use apologist in this negative way, I'm referring to a person who thinks they already know the right answer, who isn't seeking truth, or genuinely open to conclusions that differ from the ones they started with, and isn't interested in what a smart critic of their views would say. They're not trying to figure out the way the world is. They're trying to win. That project is pretty much unrelated to open exploration and inquiry, to trying to uncover the nature of the world to whatever extent possible. The term for that, in my mind, is philosopher. Apologists weaponize philosophy to defend their opinions in a WWE-style wrestling match, and it's nothing but sophistry and rhetoric. And yes, there are atheist apologists. But the fact that so many non-believers learn about philosophy for the first time through apologetics has a lot to do with the disdain for philosophy among many atheists online, I believe. <laughs> For better or worse, apologetics provided me with my intro to philosophy as a teenager. I didn't really know what philosophy was or what philosophers did, but I did want to figure out whether God existed and whether I should continue being a Christian. Based on what I learned in the first couple of years engaging with the subject, I became an atheist. But as I continued my searching, I realized that the superficiality of pop-level apologetics and the debates between apologists and counter-apologists had led me to form an unwarranted degree of confidence in my non-belief, and I had come to other hasty conclusions as well. While I was aware that some atheists were moral realists, like Sam Harris, I wasn't familiar with contemporary figures in meta-ethics like Russ Schaefer Landau, Michael Humer, or Eric Wielenberg. So reading and listening to philosophers, as well as the minority of apologists for either side that are more philosophically literate, my views on a range of subjects changed over time, including those concerning moral realism. It's not just that the apologetics version of meta-ethics is superficial relative to the literature, which could be excused since the intended audiences differ. Rather, I found out that there was a chasm between the discourse in apologetics and the discourse in meta-ethics. They might as well have been happening on different planets. In the internet trenches, Christians defend objective morals and atheists dispute that there is such a thing as objective morality. At least in my experience, that's how it typically went. But God did not come up very often in the meta-ethical literature. For those who aren't aware, 
the overwhelming majority of the talk of objective morals in apologetics concerns the moral argument, whose defenders maintain that objective morality is simply impossible without God. The only alternative is nihilism, or maybe subjectivism, which they seem to think is the same thing. The idea that atheism entails nihilism is not well subscribed at all in metaethics, even by theists. According to the Phil Papers survey, the majority of philosophers are moral realists. In fact, the majority of atheist philosophers are moral realists. To someone who had only been exposed to metaethics through apologetics, this was completely baffling. Within the moral realist camp, there's a debate over what's called moral naturalism and moral non naturalism, and we'll talk more about this later on. Despite the name, the naturalism versus non naturalism dispute between moral realists has nothing to do with atheism or theism, sort of like how libertarian free will has nothing to do with politics. A communist can believe in libertarian free will, and an atheist can be a moral non naturalist. Moral naturalism and non naturalism are both realist positions in meta ethics that accept the objectivity of morals. These are not concepts that I became familiar with as a result of listening to apologetics. I heard a lot about moral relativism, but nothing about moral non-naturalism. Instead, I heard several versions of this. Many theists and atheists alike will agree that if God does not exist, then moral values are not objective. That's from William Lane Craig. Well, I don't agree, and the majority of atheists in philosophy don't agree. Even many theists don't agree. Why do apologists almost never acknowledge the existence of moral realism apart from God? It's the majority view among atheist philosophers since most of the people with some interest in apologetics and counter-apologetics don't go on to pursue philosophy, they're never exposed to the alternatives. And by alternatives, I mean the views accepted by the majority of atheist philosophers. A multitude of people who have spent a decent amount of time reading apologetics, listening to apologists on podcasts and videos, and otherwise doing their homework, are nevertheless woefully misinformed about the range of options in prevailing views in meta-ethics. That is no small failure on the part of apologists. One thing I really dislike about pop apologists like Ray Comfort, Lee Strobel, Frank Turek, etc., is that their shortcomings are always at our expense. If they were just making honest mistakes, you'd think they'd occasionally, just by accident, make us look better than we actually are. They'd paper over some inconvenient truth from time to time. But on every issue, their mistakes make us look worse and our position less plausible. Here's something else I heard a million times. Atheists cannot account for the difference between humans and other animals. When a lion kills a gazelle, it's not guilty of murder. But without God, we're all just animals, right? In atheism, it's very difficult to explain why there should be any qualitative difference between human morality and animal morality in the way we intuit that. The behavior from chimpanzees in these wars that I just described is basically how the entire animal kingdom works. The strong devour the weak. Uh, we never think of animals mistreating each other as like sinning or something like this, or in, in the way that we think of that with human behavior. So the question is, why does morality suddenly start to change once you get to human beings? How do you account for that on atheism? Now, I guess my difficulty is that on an, I certainly agree that it's wrong to harm people, obviously. But it's hard for me to understand on a naturalistic worldview, such as I described, why on the worldview of naturalism, inflicting harm upon other members of our species is really wrong. It seems to me that this happens all the time among other animals. And so why is it wrong peculiarly for human beings to inflict harm on each other? All right, so let's start with that. S suppose that uh, my three-year-old nephew walks into your house, takes some book off your shelf, and tears the pages out. He hasn't done anything wrong. Or three-year-old, probably old enough, he has done something wrong. Make him a year and a half. He hasn't done anything wrong. If I go into your house, tear some pages out of your book, I've done something wrong. What's the difference? Well, I'm capable of appreciating reasons for respecting your property that my one-and-a-half-year-old, this is hypothetical, one-and-a-half-year-old nephew doesn't 
doesn't have the capacity. Right? There are differences between people that allow me and you to think about our behaviors, to evaluate our behaviors, to see whether or not there are legitimate reasons for behaving as we do. Creatures that don't have that capacity don't have that capacity. It's precisely because they lack that capacity that makes no sense that the notion of right and wrong behavior gets no purchase. Lions can't reflect upon their behavior, so when they do it, it's not wrong. Mm -hmm. If you or I were to engage in that behavior, we can reflect upon that. We can recognize the reasons for not behaving that way. So I think the distinction is a fairly straightforward one, not, not a deep mystery or a hard challenge for the naturalist to, to respond to. Okay, I think that's a, a good answer for why we wouldn't regard animals as moral agents who would be culpable for their acts. Um, but it seems to me that at best that answer would go to show that rationality or the ability to reflect rationally on things is a necessary condition for moral behavior. But I don't see that that's a sufficient condition for moral behavior. It's still not clear to me why uh, it would be wrong for creatures who have considerably complex neurological systems uh, to inflict harm on each other on a naturalistic worldview in the struggle for survival. Okay, so the question you asked initially was, how can I explain why it's wrong for me to murder when it's not wrong for lions to murder? And to answer that question, all it takes is for me to point out a relevant difference between us, and you've just, I think, said, yeah, all right, so I managed to do that. The distinction between moral agents and moral patients is not a recent innovation in philosophy. Like Kagan said, it's not a deep mystery whether there is a cognitive difference between a lion and a normal adult human, and the moral relevance of this fact is clear. Just think about a child versus an adult and the difference in rational faculties between them. We hold them to completely different standards. Even though a young child is not a moral agent, they're not as culpable as an adult for the same action, they're still a moral patient. Kicking a child is not the same thing as kicking a pebble or any other non-moral patient. Hitting a baseball with a baseball bat is morally neutral. Hitting a dog with a baseball bat is not. Does that fact really come down to God's commands? Or is there something about the dog that is notably different from the baseball? Anyone can see there's a difference between animal cruelty and baseball. My claim is that the difference does not come down to what God has said about it. Hey, buddy. Yeah, what's going on there, pal? Oh, my God, I just found a rat's nest. Slaughtered about 200 of them. <laughs> 200? <laughs> Couldn't be. That's Christ. Sometimes I wonder, though, if our lives are really more valuable than theirs, you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They are. Yeah. Our, our lives are, definitely, yeah. yeah without a doubt. Yeah. Without a doubt. More to the point raised by Craig and Gavin Orland a moment ago, the difference in moral accountability between humans and non-human animals is about as mysterious as the difference between adults and toddlers. It is not in any way a serious challenge to atheism. What they're saying to my ears sounds like if atheists were intellectually honest, they would hold babies and adults morally accountable in exactly the same way. The difference between moral agents, patients, and non-patients comes down to the features of the beings in question not God's will or commands. It's their nature that accounts for the difference, not whether they happen to stand in some extrinsic relation to God's nature. Another irritating canard is the moral lawgiver argument. Sure, maybe atheists can grant that there's a moral law, but without a moral lawgiver, where do these morals come from? Who or what created the moral law? So here's Russ Schaefer Landau answering this argument in his lecture, moral objectivity without God. Roughly, he argues that morals don't need to come from anywhere. There doesn't need to be a moral lawgiver any more than there needs to be a mathematical lawgiver or an epistemic norm giver. And the basic idea before I run through this is this, that someone had to make up morality. Morality is just a bunch of rules, a bunch of moral rules. That's how I'm conceiving of morality right now. It's a, kind of, it's a, it's a somewhat oversimple conception, but I think that's all we need to go with tonight. So the idea is that morality is a bunch of rules. It's a big laundry list. That well, big laundry list might be unified by one fundamental rule, like the golden rule, for instance, but it need not be. That's a separate question. I'm going to try not to get into it tonight. 
But uh, regardless of how you answer that separate question, the basic idea is this. Morality consists of a bunch of rules, and like any rule, that set of rules has to have an author. We could think of these as rules. I use the terms rules or laws here on, for purposes of the handout interchangeably. Okay? The thought is that rules have to have an author. Laws need a legislator. Morality is a bunch of laws, if you like to talk of moral laws, or it's a bunch of rules, if you like to talk of moral rules. And these things need someone to underwrite them. They need, they need someone to author them and to authorize them. And if morality is objective, then by definition, that someone cannot be any human being, or even a collective of us, say a society or a culture. So who else could do it? There's an obvious answer to that question, and that is God. God's the person who could do it. But I think that underlying that line of thought I just gave you in the last 30 seconds is the following thought, namely that if any laws or rules exist, someone had to author them. Someone has to be in a position to authorize them. And I think that claim is mistaken. When I, uh, just below, when I say for premise two, I give an argument uh, that tries to, that does, in fact, uh, provide an argument whose conclusion is premise two of the basic challenge. So here's the logic. You take a look at the basic challenge. I grant you premise number one. I push back against premise number two. I say, why do you think premise number two is correct? And what I've tried to do is I've tried to lay out then what I think of as the best defense for premise number two. And here it goes. It's that four-step argument just below. A law must have an author, or you could say a rule must have an author. I'm going to use these two terms interchangeably, laws and rules. If a law has, has to have an author, therefore, too, moral laws must have an author. And there are only two possible authors. This is three. There are only two possible authors of morality, humans and God. And therefore, it follows, if humans didn't create moral laws, then God did. Okay. I think that premise number one of this supporting argument, the claim that a law must have an author, I think that's false. Okay. This argument here, this four-step argument, is meant to bolster premise number two of the, of the basic challenge. If, if humans didn't create morality, God did. Why well, think that? The, the rock-bottom thought behind premise number two of the basic challenge is this. If you've got a set of laws or rules, someone must have written them up, or someone must have conveyed them, someone must have authored them. I believe that's false. Okay? And I want to give you some examples to chew on. And you can come back at me in the Q&A if you don't find these plausible. So I think, for instance, that the laws of mathematics and the laws of logic have no author. I don't even think that God authored the laws of logic. God is constrained by the laws of logic. When we talk about God's omnipotence, when we do, what we mean is God can do everything within the limits of logic. God cannot flout the laws of logic. God cannot make two contradictory claims simultaneously true, for instance. I don't think that's a limitate that's I don't think that's an undue, inappropriate, worrisome limitation on God's power. If it's not, then uh, well. I don't think what I was about to say is false, so let me not say that. But instead, what I want to say is uh, <laughs> instead, what I want to say is this: I don't think that the laws of logic have an author, uh, and there are other laws as well. I think um, that lack an author, or uh, the laws of rationality, for instance. I think it's irrational for someone to set out to mutilate himself just for its own sake, not because he wants, not because the mutilation is going to get him something else, but he just says, ah, self-mutilation, that's for me. I'm going for it. That person's irrational. And we can explain that by saying there's a rule of rationality that says self-mutilation pursued for its own sake is irrational. I think that rule is true. That's not the fundamental rule of rationality, but it is a rule of rationality, I think. I think it's true, and I don't think that anyone made it up. There are rules in epistemology, the study of uh, the theory of knowledge. One such rule says this. If you have a belief on the basis of no evidence and in the face of all contrary evidence, then your belief is unjustified. I think that's a true principle, a true rule about the justification of beliefs. I don't think anybody made it up. 
So what I've just done is I've tried to give you examples in which it's at least superficially plausible. We can talk about this, of course, in the Q&A. It's superficially plausible to think that human beings didn't make these rules up, and we don't need God to have made those rules up either. So what we have is the possibility of laws without any author. And if that's so, then the first premise of the supporting argument, the claim that the law must have an author, is mistaken. One problem for divine command theory has persisted in various forms for about 2,500 years since Plato first raised it in his Euthyphro dialogue. Either God has reasons for issuing his commands, or he does not have reasons. If he has a reason for forbidding torture, say because of the intrinsic features of the act, then at least some moral truths are independent of God. Thus, the moral argument fails. If human beings are intrinsically valuable, that is, valuable in and of themselves, ends in themselves, then God is superfluous here. God is not required to give human beings moral worth. Maybe God could give additional value to human life, but that's all he could do. Maybe human life is not intrinsically valuable, but only valuable in virtue of something else. For example, in virtue of some fact about God. This seems to be the implicit view of many theists, whether they admit to it or not. As I said in the opening, there's an easy solution to the Euthyphro dilemma. It's not God's say-so that makes actions right or wrong. Rather, God says so because he can see what's good and bad about these acts. God issues his commandments and prohibitions on the basis of moral reasons. Think about a particular example. It's obvious to any non-sociopath that nurturing an infant is better than smashing it against a wall. God doesn't have to somehow make it the case that one of those is better than the other. He just sees that nurturing an infant is better than brutalizing it. Doesn't that make more sense than claiming there is no evaluative fact whatsoever until God stipulates that one is better than the other? To me, it makes more sense that God knows that one is better than the other, and that he doesn't have anything to do with making it so that one is better than the other. The alternative, that God has no moral reason for his injunctions, means that the law handed down by God is morally arbitrary. That's what arbitrary means in this context. There's no reason it is the way that it is. Either God has reasons, or he doesn't. The no reasons option is not only nonsensical, but it sounds kind of blasphemous. But the first option leaves the way open for a robust moral realism independent of God. To be clear, taking that first horn is not a problem unless you want to make the moral argument work at all costs. Plenty of theistic philosophers are not inclined to twist themselves into tortured logical pretzels as divine command theorists are. It's not a problem to say that God has reasons for issuing his commands. It's not a problem to say that human life is intrinsically valuable. You have gone wrong somewhere if you think these are problems for a theistic view. Divine command theorists often reject the Euthyphro dilemma as a false dichotomy, citing God's nature as an option for moral grounding. It's not God's commands or God's will that we should be focused on. It's God's nature that forms the ontological basis for moral truths. God is the good, so there's no dilemma. First, I don't see how this genuinely splits the horns of there is a reason or there is no reason. If his reason for his commands boils down to it accords with his nature, that seems to make the good quite hollow. We're verging on a might-makes-right conception of moral truth if whatever accords with God's will is by definition the good. But for many of us, the issue is whether this pushes the problem one step back. If God's nature is goodness itself, then sure, the properties that constitute his nature are good. God is good. But we can then ask, is God good because he has these properties? Or are these properties good only if and because he has them? Or as Jeremy Coons put it, are qualities like being merciful and loving traits of God because they're good? Or are they good because they are traits of God? Again, both horns are problematic. The first makes the good external to God. The second leaves us once again without any moral reason. God's nature is as it is. To this, Craig might reply that God is essentially loving. God just wouldn't be God unless he was loving. 
But why is God essentially loving rather than essentially hateful and malicious? Perhaps because there's something special about love, almost as if it's good independently of God. What I want you to do is, I, I, don't, uh, I don't want to spend more than 10 seconds on this because it's an unsavory task, but I want to invite you to think about a very gross, extraordinarily serious kind of immorality that people can perpetrate on one another. And, you know, a number of things come to mind. I don't want to dwell on the particulars, but just imagine a case, for instance, of political torture in which we have a despotic regime, a tyrannical regime, who has isolated those who um, are uh, advocating on behalf of freedom, basic liberties. And uh, the, the folks at the top of the regime want to retain their power, and so they identify the people who are uh, members of the leadership of a pro-democracy force, and they apprehend them and take them to a torture cell. And then they begin to torture them in the very worst way that you can imagine. I'm not going to lay out the graphic details. Okay. If you contemplate a situation like that, my thought is this, that, the act, that what's going on in the torture cell is immoral. And I want, I want this to be an uncontroversial case. I guess the only way to do that is to lay out the details, but I actually am unwilling to do that. But just imagine the worst sort of torture a person can perpetrate on another. And then I want you to imagine something that's going to be very difficult for you, but I want you to try to do it anyway. And I, then I want you to try to imagine that God doesn't exist. And I want you to ask this question. I want you to imagine that God doesn't exist, and I want you to imagine surveying the scene that's going on in this torture cell. I want you to answer this simple question. Is what's going on there immoral? And I think the answer to that question is yes. And I think the answer to that question is clearly yes. That is, we can say of what's going on in that torture cell that it's immoral, and we don't need to make reference to God's will or God's commands in order to say that. We can, if we want, we can introduce that as a further additional explanation. But my thought is this, when you contemplate the nature of torture in and of itself, vividly, and see the kind of absolute dominance of one human being over another, kind of gross power imbalance, the kind of extraordinary pain that's inflicted there, the kind of, if information is sought, the kind, the kind of unreliability of the information obtained, if you obtain any information at all. Think of all of those things, and my thought is this, thinking of those features of the action is enough to make it clearly immoral. You don't also need to ask yourself a further question, does God forbid this? Does God allow this? Contemplate the nature of torture in and of itself, if you can vividly call that up to mind, is enough to know that that action is immoral. And if that's so, we've got the beginnings of an answer to my question, because what we've got is the possibility that actions are indeed immoral, or if we took an exact opposite kind of case, moral, without introducing God into the picture, but instead just talking about the specific features that confer, that make an action immoral. So is there an intrinsic moral difference between love and cruelty? Is it an essential part of his divine nature to hate the torture of babies because of the immoral features of the act? Or is there nothing intrinsically wrong with baby torture? requiring an external value imposer like God to make it the case that such acts are wrong. Asserting that God delivers his injunctions because of his nature doesn't really answer the question of moral arbitrariness. Why is his nature as it is? Replying that God is necessarily good doesn't answer the question at hand, since secular moral non-naturalists and theistic moral non-naturalists believe that moral truths are necessary, they obtain in all possible worlds. God's necessarily moral character could be intimately related to such normative truths. God is necessarily good? Well, maybe that's because God is omniscient and because there are non-natural, irreducibly normative truths that obtain across all possible worlds, just like there are mathematical truths that obtain across all possible worlds. In that case, the theist would have a convincing answer to the Euthyphro dilemma. They can keep God's necessarily good nature, and you don't have to defend nonsense arguments against secular moral realists. So, on God's necessity, 
Here's an analogy that can help clarify why I think grounding moral value in God's nature doesn't get rid of moral arbitrariness, even if we maintain that God is a necessary being. Suppose I ask whether you think everything happens for a reason, and you say, yes, everything happens for a reason, the laws of physics and the initial conditions of the universe. Now, I can infer from that answer that you do not think everything happens for a reason. The question was obviously about moral reasons. Is the universe utterly random with respect to good and evil, or is there some greater plan, a moral order behind the apparent chaos of life on Earth? The laws of physics response implies that your answer to my real question is no, since physical laws are indifferent to good and evil. Likewise, if we're talking about modified divine command theory, and I ask whether there are reasons God's moral nature is as it is, replying that he's a necessary being does not directly resolve the concern about moral arbitrariness. Again, God's necessarily moral nature could be explained by appealing to necessary moral truths, like the ones Humer, Wielenberg, and Schaefer Landau believe in, but then you'd have to give up the moral argument. So, some apologists might protest that I'm not taking the idea that God is literally identical with good seriously. And that's correct. You might as well say God is identical with the mathematical itself. And likewise, we can ask whether God had any particular reason for making 2 and 2 equal 4, or whether he didn't have a reason. Is there any reason his nature is that way, and so on? We could ask whether he even has the power to impose a completely different mathematical structure on the world where 2 and 2 equal 300. While necessary truths having to do with logic, math, and morality could be framed as limitations on God's power, in no way is it a problematic limitation on God's power that should cause you to spiral out of control and say borderline incoherent things like, oh, God is identical to the good itself. These are not worrisome limits if we're even construing them as limits. Though, when it comes to grounding morality in God, I do know what it means to say that God sets the standard, but only on a subjectivist conception of moral truth. If you're openly embracing a divine form of moral subjectivism, then your view is at least coherent. But if you insist that you believe in objective morality, stance-independent moral truths, but also that a tri-personal being is identical with stance-independent moral truths, you are speaking gibberish. More likely, you're just redefining crucial terms to make it coherent. David Hume's is ought gap is roughly the idea that it's impossible to derive an evaluative conclusion from wholly non-evaluative premises. One cannot deduce conclusions about what ought to be the case from purely descriptive premises about what is the case. There's a logical gap between ought and is, between evaluative and descriptive facts. Okay, so what's the significance of that? Some people seem to think this is a problem for all moral realists, or somehow just a problem for atheists who are moral realists, which is genuinely baffling. There seems to be this widespread assumption that you need to start with purely descriptive facts, perform some alchemy, and then get evaluative facts out of descriptive facts. But why would anyone grant that assumption? Why not instead maintain that one needs to start with purely evaluative facts and somehow get descriptive facts out of evaluative facts? Why think we need to bridge the gap at all? Why can't there just be different kinds of things in the world? Everything in the world doesn't all have to be reducible to one class of entities. I'm happy to grant that you can't get an ought from an is, you can't reach an evaluative conclusion from wholly non-evaluative premises, but who says you have to do that? Again, some people just seem totally unshakable in their belief that you just have to do that. You have to start with descriptive facts and then somehow get evaluative facts out of them, or else you can't be a moral realist, or you can't be an atheist and a moral realist. But So listen, I just issued a new decree of rationality. It starts with the profound realization that you can't get concrete objects out of wholly abstract entities. I find that when people are discussing physics and math, there never fails to be an imperceptible change from discussion of abstracta to concreta. But how is this gap between abstract and concrete bridged? Until someone can explain to me how you can get concrete objects out of purely abstract entities, 
I just won't believe in concrete objects. Everyone from now on has to share my bizarre assumption that you must start with abstract entities alone and somehow put them together in just the right way such that concreta emerge. So I don't think you can get concrete objects from purely abstract objects, but I don't see why I'd have to. Just start with concreta. Likewise, I can grant the truth of Hume's law without it being a threat to moral objectivity, or whatever it's supposed to be a threat to. We can just start with evaluative truths, taking them as basic. I'm not sure why the world wouldn't be a sundry place filled with all kinds of different things. I don't see any need to bridge the gap. Hume's law may pose a problem for some varieties of ethical naturalism, which seeks a reductionist account of moral truths to descriptive truths, but even that needs to be argued for, and in any event, we could just be non-reductionists in the sense I've been outlining. Our inability to bridge the gap does not pose a real threat to moral objectivity, let alone a threat to moral objectivity but only for atheists. While there are alleged counterexamples to Hume's law, I think there's some interpretation of it that's correct, and as we've been discussing, I think its import is often misunderstood. To quote Michael Humer in Ethical Intuitionism, we should understand what I take the doctrine's significance to be. I do not claim that Hume's law refutes ethical reductionism. Rather, I see Hume's law as an important lemma in my larger argument that one cannot account for moral knowledge without appealing to something like ethical intuition. To that end, I argue, a, that we cannot know moral truths by observation, b, that we cannot know non-trivial moral truths by deducing them from non-moral truths, c, that we cannot know non-trivial moral truths by conceptual analysis, and d, that we cannot know moral truths by scientific reasoning or inference to the best explanation. This understanding of the use I make of Hume's law has implications for how we should treat alleged exceptions to the law. Such exceptions are important only if they represent possible ways of coming to know moral truths on the basis of non-moral truths. Thus, if there should prove to be a valid deductive inference containing only non-evaluative premises and an evaluative conclusion, but for some reason this inference could not be the source of our knowledge of the conclusion, then it would be irrelevant to my purposes here. It would be an exception to Hume's law as traditionally stated, but not one that damages my argument in this chapter. End quote. So I included that just to give you a taste of how Hume's law might factor into an argument discussed in a meta-ethical textbook like that one, since, as I've been explaining, the doctrine's significance is often misunderstood. <laughs> Hume's law can provide another arrow in the quiver against divine command theory. The problem can be summed up as follows. It may be a descriptive fact that God commands X, or God forbids Y, but we also need an evaluative fact in the mix. Namely, we ought to obey God's commands. That's a necessary part of the puzzle. I could annoyingly ask the poorly formed question, but where does that fact come from? My main point, though, is that knowing what God commands isn't enough. It seems as though you need a basic, primitive, unexplained fact about what one ought to do here. Even if you know what God commands, you haven't answered why we ought to obey his commands. Maybe you think it's a very reasonable thought that we should obey God's commands, but it's a separate, evaluative fact nonetheless. The descriptive facts about what God commands are not sufficient. We need an evaluative ought fact, at least implicitly, to make it right to follow God and wrong to disobey him. But what could this fact be other than an irreducibly normative truth, exactly like the objective evaluative facts the defender of the moral argument is so desperate to avoid? Further, it's hard to see how a belief in a basic moral truth, even something that seems as obvious to the theist as we ought to obey God, it's hard to see how that could be justified in the complete absence of ethical intuition and our universal reliance on ethical intuition is one of my central points. But setting aside moral epistemology for a moment, could it be the case that God ontologically grounds the truth of we ought to obey God's commands? Should we obey God's commands because God commands us to obey his commands? Well, I mean, I don't think so. <laughs> hmm. Should we obey God's commands because God commands us to obey his commands? Whether we ought to obey his commands is the issue we're trying to suss out in the first place. 
The whole thing is just dizzyingly circular. So let's back up a step. The question is, why should anyone obey God's commands? Craig and others maintain that we are obligated to act in certain ways because God commands it. But in the absence of an explanation for why anyone should obey these commands, I don't think moral obligation has actually been explained. What if we don't want to obey God? If that seems like an annoying question, then you know how we feel when the equivalent question is posed to the atheist. What if we don't want to be moral? So here's one bad answer to both questions. There's punishment in store for those who violate moral obligations. Whether it's the law, or some amount of suffering in the hereafter, you won't get away with it. But this is just a naked appeal to self-interest. It's not a moral reason to obey God or do what's right. An appeal to prudential reasons is not the same as an appeal to moral reasons. So here's a much better answer to the question, why obey God? If I were a theist, this is how I would answer it. We should obey God's commands because God is omniscient, and thus knows what's morally right. He's also perfectly loving, and would never command us to do something wrong. Even though, if I were a theist, this would be my answer, most theists wouldn't like it since it presupposes that there are objective moral facts independent of God. He's just the infallible knower and conveyor of these facts. I think that's pretty cool, but apparently it's not enough. Perhaps he is responsible for aligning our moral intuitions with these moral facts, but still they're independent and external to God himself. So if there aren't any such facts, but if we still say we should obey God because God knows what's good, then this is just stating that God knows what he commands, <laughs> or he knows his own nature, and he'd never command us to do anything other than what he commands. He'd never command us to do anything that doesn't accord with his nature. Uh, okay, I mean, that could be true of a lot of people. I'll never command you to do anything other than what I command you to do. God knows what's good. Doesn't really seem like a great explanation of why we should obey God, unless you affirm the existence of independent moral facts. It's obviously circular to say we should obey God's commands because God commanded us to obey his commands. But Craig actually denies that this is problematic. The question is why I should obey God's commands. And Craig's answer is that God commands that I obey his commands. Okay, so why should I obey that command? Well, because God commanded that I obey that command. Craig claims to see no problem with this. Here's another option to consider. Maybe it's just a brute, unexplained fact that you have to obey God's commands. After all, people in my position find themselves appealing to brute facts. Why can't the theist do the same? It's just a brute fact that you ought to obey God's commands. Most people in this debate, everyone from Craig to humor, will concede that one must tolerate some unexplained facts in their theory. There are going to be theoretical primitives. But if we're invoking moral axioms, shouldn't they seem obvious? Like, if I just say it's a brute fact that there's something rather than nothing, we can debate the merits of that view, but surely it's more plausible than saying it's just a brute fact that turtles exist. We seek out evolutionary explanations of turtles because no one even entertains the idea that turtle existence would just be a brute fact. Well, I'm sure someone does, but look, not all purported, brute, unexplained facts are equally plausible candidates for that slot. Something like suffering is bad seems like a more obvious candidate for a basic moral axiom than one ought to always obey the commands of the tripersonal first cause. It's just obvious that pain is bad. It's obvious that we shouldn't punish the innocent. It's comparatively far less obvious that one should obey God's commands. Don't you want to find out what the commands are first? What if they're like the commands given by Allah, or Yahweh in the Old Testament? So we should focus on that point about theoretical primitives for a moment, since many moral anti-realists and defenders of the moral argument, who not coincidentally say many of the same things, are bothered by this point. Gavin Ortland, in his defense of the moral argument, said that he finds it troubling just how brute non-theistic moral realism turns out to be, which on some level is fair enough. The title of Michael Humer's response to William Lane Craig is Groundless Morals. What Gavin wants is a grounding of morality. But as we've been discussing, when you turn the same critical eye to divine command theory, it doesn't rise to the challenge. So here's what I consider to be an Oppian objection to the moral argument that comes to us from Joe Schmid, which he calls the both end and primitives objection. So the atheist, let's say, thinks that torturing someone is objectively wrong. Well, you can ask why, and you know maybe they're going to cite certain facts about torture and facts about the victim and facts about suffering. Well, then you can say, oh yeah, but why is suffering bad? 
you've kind of hit a primitive bedrock there because it is right. Maybe that's either self-explanatory. Maybe it's not self-explanatory if we think that self-explanation is incoherent, but maybe this is just a primitive, but it's justifiably taken to be a primitive. Or maybe you think eudaimonia or flourishing or happiness or the flourishing of sentient beings or whatever is something that is just the primitive bedrock with respect to explaining why certain things are good. So yeah, you can play the why game with the atheist, but of course the atheist can turn around and similarly play the why game with the theist. What it metaphysically explains why torturing someone for fun is wrong. They might say certain rights or suffering is bad, but then you can ask why. Then they might say, oh, well, because God commands it to be that way or because God's nature is such that and then they give some story about God's nature. But again, you can still ask why. Why does God's nature give rise to that? Why does God's nature forbid rape? Why is God's nature such that it specifies that suffering is bad? Why is God's nature such that it specifies that human flourishing is good? You can ask these questions just as much of the theist. And they're eventually just going to have to say, lest they admit an infinitely descending regress of groundings, they're, they're also going to have to end in some kind of primitive bedrock. So both of us are ending in primitive bedrocks. We just fundamentally say, X grounds the badness or rightness or wrongness or goodness or badness of something, and that's that. End of story. You can try to ask, why does it ground the, the wrongness or badness or whatever? And again, we've just hit explanatory bedrock. And so it's not at all clear that the theist is in any better position than the non-theist with respect to grounding morality in this case. Both have a ground. It's just that their grounds are different. Both end in something that just primitively grounds, let's say, the badness of suffering, or that primitively grounds the goodness of the flourishing of sentient beings, or whatever. It's not at all clear why we should prefer a primitive ground, which is something like, God's nature is such as to specify that this is bad, or God's nature is such as to specify that this is good. It's not at all clear why that is a better primitive than the various primitives that I've been suggesting for the non-theist. And there's actually a really good article that makes a point that's quite similar to this, and it is called Could Morality Have a Source by Chris Heathwood. It's published in the Journal of Ethics and Social Philosophy. And he argues quite convincingly that ultimately every single meta-ethical theory is going to have some kind of primitive bedrock, that there's going to be some sort of moral truth or some sort of link between a grounding fact and the moral truth that it grounds. There's going to be some sort of fact like that has to be primitive on any theory whatsoever. So he says, it is a common idea that morality or moral truths, if there are any, must have some sort of source. If it is wrong to make a promise or if our fundamental moral obligation is to maximize happiness, these facts must come from somewhere, perhaps from human nature or from our agreements or God. Such facts cannot be ungrounded, floating free. I not only deny this, I believe it's opposite. If we look more closely at the moral theories that are supposed to be paradigm examples of theories under which morality has a source, we will see that these theories too posit ungrounded moral truths. We are anyway here inquiring into the sort of explanation constituted by a kind of metaphysical grounding. And this metaphysical grounding, whatever else it is, is an asymmetric relation. If Q is true in virtue of P, P cannot also be true in virtue of Q. So the basic problem that he's pinpointing here is that we have this claim, right, which is DCT, divine command theory. And it's saying that an act is morally obligatory if and only if and because God commands it. Now, we then ask, is God in some way or another the source of DCT itself, right? Because this is itself a kind of moral claim. It's making a claim about the conditions under which something is morally obligatory. So this is itself a moral claim. And so then we can ask, well, in virtue of what is this moral claim true? Well, if it's true in virtue of something about God, well then, again, we have just created another moral claim. Namely, the moral claim of DCT itself would then be true just in case and because of that more fundamental feature of God, which is explaining the moral truth of DCT. But again, that link between this more fundamental feature of God and DCT is itself a moral claim, right? Because DCT, as we've shown, is a moral claim, and so we are talking about the conditions under which a particular moral claim is true. In particular, we're asking what makes it true. That is itself a moral claim. And so then we can still further ask, what is the grounding of that moral claim? If you're going to posit a still more fundamental feature of God, well, then you could see where we're going. We're off on a vicious, infinite regress. So it seems as though we have to bottom out in some sort of primitive moral claim here. The only way to avoid a primitive moral truth, then, that is a moral truth that isn't itself grounded in something more fundamental, the only way to avoid that is then to adopt something like self-grounding, where one and the same thing grounds itself. But that is, of course, absurd. Grounding is a priority relation. One thing is due to or owed to another, and it obtains in virtue of that other. And it's well now universally granted in philosophy that grounding relations are asymmetric. If one thing grounds another, then that further thing doesn't ground the first thing. So everyone, it seems, is going to have to admit groundless moral facts. It is moral facts that don't themselves have any further explanation or ground. And so it's no mark against a non-theistic theory that, oh, well, it can't ground all of morality. No, because neither can a theistic theory.
So broadly speaking, there are two classes of moral realism. And as we've moved along, I'm sure that you've gleaned at least the gist of my view, Humer's view, Wielenberg's view, Schaefer Landau's view. We're all atheists and moral realists. Specifically, we subscribe to what's called ethical non-naturalism. Among moral realists, there's a divide between the moral naturalists and the non-naturalists. And if it isn't obvious, the naturalism in this context has nothing to do with God. The difference between the naturalists and the non-naturalists comes down to a metaphysical thesis and an epistemological thesis. The naturalists are reductionists. They try to reduce moral truths to natural facts. That is, they try to reduce evaluative facts to concrete descriptive facts. The non-naturalists, on the other hand, are not reductionists. They think moral truths are basic and not able to be reduced to descriptive facts. They're taken to be in the same general category as numbers and propositions. Further, the two major moral realist camps differ in their epistemology, not just their ontology. The non-naturalists rely heavily on intuition, tending slightly more towards rationalism, whereas the naturalists try to be more in line with the spirit of empiricism and scientific inquiry. So, I disagree with the moral naturalists. I think there are irreducibly normative truths, evaluative facts that cannot be explained in terms of something more fundamental. With or without God, the chain of explanation has to end somewhere, and basic axioms, illuminated by moral intuition and the light of reason, seem like the most plausible candidates to me. If you recall Hume's law earlier, I didn't say that the gap between is and ought refutes reductionism on its own. I cited Humer who said that the gap is an important premise and a larger argument for his particular brand of non-naturalism called ethical intuitionism. Ethical intuitionism, roughly speaking, is a fusion of the ontology of moral non-naturalism and the epistemological thesis of phenomenal conservatism. We're not really digging into that now, I just kind of wanted to gesture towards a couple of interviews I had with Michael Humer about these things. So, outside the context of apologetics, I discussed meta-ethics, nihilism, moral fictionalism, moral disagreement, evolutionary debunking arguments, the companions and guilt argument, and much else with Michael Humer when I was first getting more into the subject as a result of reading his books. We also spoke about phenomenal conservatism in another interview, so do check those out if you want to learn more about meta-ethics and epistemology outside of the howling wasteland of F-tier apologetics. One major stumbling block for the moral argument is whether God could ground moral objectivity. There are two distinct propositions on which the moral argument crucially rests. A. God can ground moral objectivity. And B. This is the only way to get moral objectivity. Both, in my view, are completely indefensible. If you want to refute B, you need to refute ethical naturalism and non naturalism. As for A, God can ground moral objectivity. We can raise objections based on intrinsicality and Euthyphro related considerations, but there's a less appreciated reason for rejecting the idea that God can provide the basis for moral objectivity. Grounding morality in God bottoms out in a form of moral subjectivism. It's just not an objective theory. I'm not saying you can't ground morality in a person, or three persons, as the case may be. You can. There's a term for that class of views. Moral subjectivism. In standard classification schemes, subjectivism is a form of moral anti-realism. It stands in contrast with theories of objective morality, which is probably why defenders of the moral argument and moral anti-realists often say the same exact things. Divine command theorists talk as if they've provided a way to moral objectivity, but that's only because they're working with a funny definition of objective, which people like Craig are completely explicit about. As long as there's a standard, a reference point independent of human beings, then it counts as objective in some sense. So here's what Michael Humer says about this. Quote, Now, the first problem for Craig's account of morality is that it is simply not an objectivist theory. If true, it makes morality subjective, not objective. This is because Craig holds that morality constitutively depends on the attitudes of an observer. The observer in this case is a very interesting one, but an observer nonetheless. Craig might object. He might say that morality is objective as long as it doesn't depend on human observers. It can still depend on non-human observers, 
I try not to spend too much time on semantic debates, so I will just say that I think this would be an artificial way of drawing boundaries. Physical facts, the paradigm of objectivity, are not constitutively dependent on any observers whatsoever. They can exist by themselves. If one says that moral facts need some special observer, then one is conceding that they are not objective in the robust sense that physical facts are. In that case, I think one's view is more like that of thinkers who reduce morality to facts about other observers' attitudes than it is like the ones who hold that moral facts are just as objective as physical facts. Eric Wielenberg and I are robust moral realists. We think moral facts are independent of anyone's attitudes. Next to us, Craig is the subjectivist in the room. So, Craig doesn't agree that his divine command theory is a form of subjectivism, partly on the grounds that moral value is grounded in God's nature, not God's will or attitudes. I don't think this makes any real difference. If morality constitutively depends on a person, or three persons, then it's hard to see how a closer look at the details will reveal objective, person-independent moral truths. How could it be independent of persons? You're explicitly grounding it in three persons. Independent of humans is a terrible and obviously artificial and ad hoc definition of objective. Plenty of things are independent of humans that are obviously not objective in the sense that, say, physical facts are objective. If aliens invented a game like chess, I don't think the rules would count as objective just because they're independent of humans. I don't think social rules invented by chimpanzees would count as objective either. Craig would respond that while those are not human observers, they're still finite observers. Oh, they're finite observers. So I suppose if it were an infinite observer, that would make it objective. And so would three observers, who were also just one observer. Again, this is a self-evidently gerrymandered way of drawing boundaries. Craig is not giving a conception of objectivity that maps onto the meaning of the term in any other context. He's just defending the moral argument at all costs. <laughs> and if that means defining objective as independent of finite observers and or dependent on an infinite observer, then he's more than happy to do that. Stubbornly, the age of the earth is an objective physical fact. It doesn't constitutively depend on any person, finite or infinite. When we say it's objective, nobody means constitutively dependent on an infinite observer. At any rate, if you did mean that, you would clearly be less of an objectivist than someone who thinks that fact doesn't depend on any observer. As Humor put it, next to us, Craig is the subjectivist in the room. Plus, Craig acknowledges that moral duties, on his account, are constituted by God's commands. In a nutshell, good and evil are grounded in God's nature, but right and wrong are constituted by God's commands, and so are dependent on his will. So Craig can't avoid the fact that he's a subjectivist when it comes to moral duties. But even on that point, Craig doesn't see a problem, since God is a necessary being. According to Craig, the troubling aspect of subjectivism is the apparent arbitrariness and contingency of moral truths. Necessity should avoid this worry, in his view. So I don't agree, for a number of reasons. Imagine a subjectivist necessitarian. They adopt moral subjectivism explicitly, but they think everything is necessary. Nothing could be other than it is. Would that suffice as a defense of subjectivism and put to rest all the objections that non-subjectivists typically have? No, I don't think so. A subjectivist who also thinks everything is necessary will not have allayed the worries of non-subjectivists. So let's look at Craig responding to Humor to get a fuller picture here. Quote, What about Humor's objections to divine command theory's account of the objectivity of moral duties? Here we return to Humor's allegation that divine command theory is a subjectivist theory. We saw that the allegation is flatly false with respect to moral values, since these are independent of the divine will. But what about moral duties, which are constituted by God's commands, and so dependent on his will? Truths about right and wrong are not independent of God's attitudes. Now, when one reflects that much of what God morally wills and commands is willed and commanded by him necessarily, being entailed by the divine nature, and therefore neither contingent nor arbitrary, then the dependence of right and wrong on God's attitudes serves mainly to call into question humor's characterization of objective morality. Attitude dependence is supposed to express the contingency and arbitrariness of the feature so dependent, and that is what makes subjectivism and morality objectionable. But that fails to significantly apply to God. A better definition of objective morality would appeal to independence of the attitudes of human observers or finite observers. Humor does not like this move because physical facts 
the paradigm of objectivity, are not constitutively dependent on any observers whatsoever. Now, even if we reject observer-dependent interpretations of quantum mechanics, still, Humer's affirmation fails of special relativity theory, which holds that simultaneity and relations of earlier and later are indeed observer-dependent. This most emphatically does not mean that such relations are subjective, but that they are relative to inertial frames. Moreover, on theism, physical facts are no more independent of God's attitude than are moral facts. Indeed, being contingent, they are less so, for they depend upon God's will to create the physical objects and preserve them in being. Observer dependence, then, ought not have reference to God, lest the distinction between objective and subjective collapse. End quote. So, there are several questionable aspects of that passage. Um, let's go in reverse order. Actually, I heard this point raised in the Q&A in the debate between Justin Schieber and Eric Hernandez, which I was present for, and Justin and I talked about this in our post-debate breakdown. So, Craig warns that if we define subjective as observer dependence, then the distinction between subjective and objective will collapse for theists, since everything depends on God and that seems like it should count against Humor's definition. After all, if God created the universe and sustains it in existence, wouldn't everything be subjective in the sense of observer dependence, including physical facts? So Humor's definition is just a bad definition. So I think this would be a really interesting objection if you were a pantheist or a panentheist, but Humor doesn't define subjectivity in the context of metaethics as mere observer dependence in any sense you can imagine. He explicitly defines it as constitutive dependence, which is not analogous to all forms of dependence. When we say X depends on Y, we could mean a range of things. Maybe X causally depends on Y, like you causally depend on your parents. But you're not constituted by your parents, like wood constitutes a table. These are obviously different kinds of dependence. Likewise, there are different kinds of observer dependence. The placebo effect is more akin to the previous example of causal dependence, where the attitudes of observers cause differing outcomes, but that's not an example of constitutive dependence. Examples of that would include being funny, or sexually attractive, or boring, or riveting, and so on. As Humor explains, a subjective property is one that is at least partly constituted by its tendency to elicit a certain reaction from observers. In other words, if funniness is subjective, Part of what it is for a thing to be funny is for observers to have or be disposed to have some particular sort of reaction to it. End quote. So if we say a movie or a book is boring, that's because it tends to elicit a certain reaction from observers. For moral subjectivists, morality is constituted by the attitudes, opinions, dispositions, reactions, approval, slash disapproval, etc. of a person or persons. Now, a lot of divine command theorists will make spurious claims about how moral obligations and duties are always connected to persons or some such, which is why God would make the best explanation for them. I think they should just embrace their subjectivism. They're just obviously not in the same category as philosophers like Russ Schaefer Landau, Michael Humer, Eric Wielenberg, Thomas Nagel, and so on, who truly think morality is objective. On seven being greater than two, it doesn't matter what anyone thinks about it. No one's will enters into the picture. Moral realists think evaluative facts are like that. Divine command theorists plainly do not. But in any event, physical facts do not constitutively depend on God. I mean, maybe if you're a pantheist or a panentheist, but even then I'm not sure if it fits. So, look, if you're a Christian pantheist, whatever that means, then we can talk. Right now, I'm only addressing, you know, 99% of the defenders of the moral argument, like Craig, who are not pantheists. So, Craig doesn't like Humer's claim that physical facts are objective for another reason. Quote, Now, even if we reject observer-dependent interpretations of quantum mechanics, still, Humer's affirmation fails of special relativity theory, which holds that simultaneity and relations of earlier and later are indeed observer-dependent. This most emphatically does not mean that such relations are subjective, but that they are relative to inertial frames. End quote. This strikes me more as rhetoric than providing a genuine counterexample that should make us worry about humor's definition. As Craig is no doubt aware, an observer need not be a mind or a person, and in relativity, 
The frame does not need to be occupied by a mind or a person either. Besides, it's unclear whether Humor himself is targeted by the point about relativity, since he has an unorthodox interpretation of relativity. And so does Craig. So next, Craig says, Truth about right and wrong are not independent of God's attitudes. Now when one reflects that much of what God morally wills and commands is willed and commanded by him necessarily, being entailed by the divine nature, and therefore neither contingent nor arbitrary, then the dependence of right and wrong on God's attitudes serves mainly to call into question Humer's characterization of objective morality. Attitude dependence is supposed to express the contingency and arbitrariness of the feature so dependent, and that is what makes subjectivism in morality objectionable. So I think some theists would certainly have an issue with claiming that God does what he does necessarily, that his actions are necessary. But let's set that aside since theists don't really have their story straight about divine freedom on the one hand and necessity on the other. I think Craig is only half right that attitude dependence is, quote, supposed to express the contingency and arbitrariness of the feature so dependent, and that is what makes subjectivism and morality objectionable. So that's certainly part of what makes it objectionable, but I think what makes attitude dependence objectionable is not just contingency and arbitrariness, but just attitude dependence. It just seems like an implausible reduction. When we give examples like funniness or boringness as subjective, the point is not just to draw attention to contingency and arbitrariness, we're trying to induce an intellectual appearance. Like, it seems that this is the correct account of X. It seems right that whether a movie is boring or riveting constitutively depends on the minds of observers. To say that the movie was boring is just to describe your reaction, attitudes, opinions, etc. That is the stuff of boringness. And consider that it seems perfectly reasonable to say that the same movie was riveting for me, but boring for you, or boring to a hypothetical alien. It's not that I'm right and you're wrong. It's subjective. So, for reasons that we've already covered pretty extensively, I think divine command theory is not free from moral arbitrariness, even if we stipulate that God is metaphysically necessary. In many ways, it's just beside the point. I ask if there are reasons God's moral nature is as it is, and you reply, he's a necessary being. That's sort of like asking if you think everything happens for a reason, and you say, yeah, the laws of physics. Well, that's obviously not what I was asking, was it? Contrary to what Craig asserts, it's not just the contingency of subjectivism that makes it suspect. For example, whether or not it's right to genocide an ethnic minority depends entirely on what people contingently think about it. There's a prima facie plausibility that the age of the earth is objective, while the boringness of a movie is subjective. Those two claims just sound right. And we can press further, and those initial judgments seem to make more sense. Now, would it make any sense to say that the movie was objectively boring because an infinite observer necessarily finds it boring? To me, it would not seem as though boringness had been elevated to objective status just because an infinite observer necessarily forms a particular attitude. I mean, again, it is just a self-evidently gerrymandered definition of objectivity. You're just defending the moral argument at all costs. You are obviously not getting to objective morality from God. So, you can think of divine command theorists as moral reductionists. They take moral truths and reduce them to something more fundamental. There is an asymmetric grounding relation in place. God's commands and or his nature take explanatory and ontological priority with respect to moral truths. In other words, he grounds moral truths. People like Humer and Wielenberg are non-reductionists they take moral truths as irreducible. As a non-reductionist, to try to help you see where I'm coming from, just replace your preferred reduction base with some other candidate. If you tried to reduce moral truths to facts about rocks, that would prima facie sound like an implausible reduction of moral truths. The problem is not really the contingency and arbitrariness of the view. It just doesn't seem like moral truths are grounded in descriptive facts about rocks you would need some very powerful arguments to support that view, to overcome its initial implausibility. Likewise, I don't think moral truths are grounded in descriptive facts of any kind, including descriptive facts about God's nature or commands. 
So, to be clear, even as a non reductionist, I don't think every reductionist view is equally implausible. My priors differ across competing hypotheses, and I don't think the theistic hypotheses are all indefensible. I've tried to be clear from the start divine command theory cannot provide us with objective morality. I did not say God couldn't ground morality. It's just that this would amount to a cosmic form of moral subjectivism, which I think theists should be more brave about embracing. You don't believe in objective evaluative facts. You do believe in a standard that is independent of humans, and that might seem like it's close enough to objectivity if you never think about it, but doubling down on the moral argument will lead you to some very silly positions, like if the observer is infinite, constitutive dependence actually counts as objective. Just embrace moral subjectivism already. As a side note, let me reference something Chris Watkins said in an interview on Parker Sedeke's podcast about Foucault. So he thinks that the biblical Christian view doesn't fit neatly into the objective-subjective-truth divide. And he doesn't want to let analytic philosophers do the table setting, because once you're operating on a more standard paradigm, you're going to lose important features of the biblical view as he sees it. It's not objective, but it's also not quite subjective. In his words, you have to let the Bible do the table setting. And an advantage of a view like that is that it doesn't try to shoehorn God-grounded morality into the category of objective truth. So I'd be open-minded to do a case for that. You could also just embrace objective morality, if you're so inclined. There's been an escape hatch available to the theist this entire time. Are God's commands good because God issues them? Or does God issue them because they're good? It's the latter. God issues them because they're good. Are there reasons God gave those commands? Yes. So you think God doesn't ground moral truth, that he's superfluous to moral truth? Uh, yeah. Just like two and two managed to equal four all on their own, without God saying so. Turns out, torturing a baby is wrong, all on its own, without God saying so. That might not be the most pious-sounding view, but why would a genuine truth-seeker care about that? Though, one might argue that it seems impious to suggest that God's goodness is so conspicuously hollow. When a divine command theorist says, God is good, they're really not saying much. God is good roughly translates to, God is the way he is, and God commands what he commands. Wow, praise the Lord! God commands what he commands! On some level, wouldn't it be more respectful to God to think that his moral perfection is not an amorphous, contentless blob that just gloms on to the way he is? I mean, if it feels weird to say it sounds as if he's living up to some standard, keep in mind, what we're talking about is love, and justice, and mercy, and moral goodness itself. Isn't loving kindness good? The fact that God is perfectly loving isn't bled of its meaning on an objectivist view. It's given meaning by an objectivist view, a meaning that is not gratingly circular. And if it's unclear, I'm not exactly blazing a path here. Plenty of Christian philosophers take this route. Before we move along, here are two additional problems for divine command theory, or three depending on how you count them. Like other moral subjectivists, divine command theorists must hold that seemingly horrible actions like genocide, terrorism, and torture are morally right as long as the appropriate person or a group of three persons endorses them. For Jews, Muslims, and Christians, this is not just a hypothetical concern. For example, in the Old Testament, God sends supernatural snakes to attack the Israelites, men, women, and children alike, for being insufficiently deferential to him. He also sends two bears to maul a group of boys for being rude. He also commands a genocide, floods the entire world, and you get the point. Of course, none of that happened, but the point is that we couldn't say that it was wrong on divine command theory. In fact, if you're really a divine command theorist, You should wait to find out whether those things happened before you make a judgment. If they're just metaphors or something, then, phew, you get to trust your moral intuitions like the rest of us. 
But if they really happened, as hundreds of millions of Christians believe and have believed, then the divine command theorist is committed to endorsing those actions and whatever God decides to do next week. Second, a problem with grounding morality in God, in addition to the fact that it's doubtful that God exists, is that even if he does exist, God's nature and commands are extremely uncertain. Oh, we're grounding morality in God's commands? And what does God command exactly? The problem of knowing what God wants is not a trivial concern. The various branches and denominations of the Abrahamic religions have core disagreements that have historically resulted in brutal executions and other forms of violent conflict. People who agree that moral truth is grounded in God, emphatically, do not agree about what God wants from us. And in addition to this epistemological problem, one might argue that it's a little surprising that God is trying to communicate his moral law to us, and yet there is so much moral disagreement among theists. Even if we restrict things to Christians, there is so much moral disagreement. It's not like ethical intuitionists think that these non-natural properties are like desperately trying to communicate with us. They're making us in their image and imprinting their moral law on our heart. And besides, moral realists will often make the case that moral disagreement, at least in our case, is seriously overblown. I talked about this a bit with Michael Humer in our conversation about metaethics. So, in sum, divine command theory is a terrible metaethical theory. For one, it is falsely advertised as providing objective morality. At best, it can only do so with an ad hoc, gerrymandered definition of objective morality. Because it is a subjectivist theory, it leaves you with the problem of horrible endorsements, where certain actions, like torture, are in fact morally right, as long as the appropriate person or group endorses them. It also creates new areas of moral disagreement, since even if God exists and morality is grounded in him, we don't know what he commands. And of course, it's vulnerable to Euthyphro-style dilemmas, which either will lead us to ethical truths independent of God, thus refuting divine command theory, or leave us with nothing more than a morally arbitrary set of rules, backed by force. So when we speak about the moral argument, we're usually talking about Craig's version, but there are many moral arguments, and there are at least two that are actually good by my lights. The first is the argument from moral agents. The existence of moral agents, rational beings who can contemplate moral truths and freely make moral choices, is less surprising on theism than on naturalism. And as I said in my debate with John Buck, I think this argument basically works. It does raise the probability of theism, but it's not enough to significantly alter my credence in theism. And keep in mind, I'm not talking about the distinction between moral agents and moral patients being some kind of problem for atheism, which is something we addressed early on. The existence of moral agents, that is, rational beings who can contemplate moral truths, is just less surprising on theism than it is on naturalism. It's at least not wildly improbable that God would want to create creatures that can contemplate the good, image bearers who are more godlike relative to other parts of his creation. But on naturalism, it easily could have been the case that consciousness didn't exist at all, let alone conscious persons capable of moral reasoning. Even if consciousness is fundamental, that by itself wouldn't lead us to expect moral agents specifically, any more than it would lead us to expect lemur consciousness. Maybe on forms of directed naturalism, where there's some tendency towards the good, or at least some form of naturalism that rejects the strongest formulations of the hypothesis of indifference, maybe there isn't a disparity when it comes to the expectations of theism. As Philip Goff explains in his book, Why? The Purpose of the Universe, there are value selection hypotheses other than theism, like panagentialism, on which the existence of moral agents would not be as surprising as on indifference. In fact, something like panagentialism 
may be better supported by the evidence of moral agency than theism, since there doesn't seem to be as much of a problem with understated evidence. Like much of the evidence for theism, moral agency is problematically understated. The general fact, moral agents exist, does seem to lend some support for theism relative to the hypothesis of indifference, but when we take a closer look at more specific facts, we encounter details about moral agents that fly in the face of the very expectations the argument relies upon to get off the ground to begin with. As Paul Draper points out, quote, Moral agency is predicted by theism better than by naturalism. But given its existence, the variety and frequency of conditions that severely limit our freedom seem more likely on naturalism. End quote. I would add that the existence of defective moral agents, people like sociopaths and psychopaths, who are supposedly also image bearers, diminishes this line of evidence for theism. But even without invoking severely defective moral agents, ordinary human beings are in some sense very unimpressive moral agents. It's not like human beings are ideal moral reasoners, to give one example. And I can imagine theists not finding that so persuasive, but what generated the prediction of moral agents in the first place? What is it about theism that leads one to think the existence of moral agents counts in its favor? Once you answer that question, I think it becomes clear why more specific facts about moral agency in our world, like defective moral agents, the variety and frequency of conditions that severely limit our freedom, cut against theism. So that's my quick response to the argument from moral agents. I think it probably does belong in a cumulative case for theism, but it doesn't move me as much as it would were it not for those two issues with the argument. One, there are non-theistic value selection hypotheses that do as well or better than theism in predicting and explaining the evidence, and not just the general fact. And two, the argument for theism seems to problematically understate the evidence. So the next one is the argument from moral knowledge. A common refrain one hears in the context of the moral argument is that we shouldn't conflate moral ontology with moral epistemology. However, there are some arguments based on moral epistemology as well, some of which are much stronger than the standard moral argument. In their paper, God and Moral Knowledge, Dustin Crummett and Philip Swenson defend one such argument. Quote, Our moral beliefs ultimately depend, in some way, on what philosophers call moral intuitions. When we consider certain moral claims, we can just see whether they're true. We can see that, at least absent extenuating circumstances, hatred is bad, virtue is good, killing innocent people is wrong, etc. With these intuitions in place, we can reason and make our moral judgments more accurate. The problem for the naturalist here is that if naturalism is true, it seems that the faculties responsible for our intuitions were formed through purely natural processes that didn't aim at producing true beliefs. For instance, it seems plausible that our intuition, that you shouldn't cause pain without a good reason, was instilled in us by evolution, since communities of our ancestors who flippantly inflicted harm on each other wouldn't have lasted. But this might unnerve the naturalist who believes in moral knowledge. After all, it seems that we might have easily had very different moral intuitions. For instance, Darwin suggested that, quote, if men were reared under precisely the same conditions as hive bees, our unmarried females would, like the worker bees, think it a sacred duty to kill their brothers, and mothers would strive to kill their fertile daughters, and no one would think of interfering. End quote. So, if we did end up with true moral beliefs in a world where our intuitions were shaped by natural selection alone, then one might think this is a great coincidence. It's by pure luck that you happen to believe the right thing. But if you're just lucky in believing what's true, you don't have knowledge any more than someone who, by chance, looks at a broken clock during one of the two times a day it happens to be correct. You don't know the time by looking at a broken clock, even if it happens to be right by accident. And you don't know moral truths by relying on moral intuitions that are only right by accident. So naturalists are in a tough spot. It seems like we have to give up our moral knowledge. We either have to accept moral skepticism, or we have to accept a big coincidence. A big coincidence that theism doesn't need, and then give up our moral knowledge anyway. Obviously, the argument goes, we should instead give up the idea that the processes responsible for our moral intuitions are in no way directed towards moral truth. Just like we need someone to set the clock to align with the time, maybe a designer aligned our moral intuitions with moral truth. Without God, 
The faculties we use to form moral beliefs are ultimately the result of natural processes that were aimed at giving us beliefs which maximize reproductive fitness, not aimed at giving us true moral beliefs. Quote, Theism can secure moral knowledge without having to posit a happy accident. Rather, God ensured that there would be some degree of alignment between our intuitions and moral truth. Thus, theism can provide an explanation of why our moral beliefs are often true. If the best naturalism can do is posit a happy accident, theism provides a better explanation of the existence of moral knowledge. So, I'm simplifying the argument for our purposes, glazing over many nuances addressed in the article, so I'd encourage you to read the very short paper yourself, which is free online. So, evolutionary debunking arguments are really fascinating. They're often construed as a challenge to moral realism. You know, how could our moral judgments reliably correlate with causally inert moral facts? Our belief-forming dispositions are not free from the influence of evolution, and it's difficult to see how non-natural moral properties could be connected with them. So, this isn't an argument from theists primarily. It's an argument usually given in defense of moral anti-realism. And one prominent response to these sorts of arguments is a third-factor approach. If we're trying to explain the correlation between two factors, A and B, in this case, moral facts and human moral beliefs, then we can appeal to a third factor, C, which is linked up, as it were, with both. Defenders of the third factor approach can differ on what C actually is. David Enoch, for instance, identifies the goodness of survival or reproductive fitness. Derek Parfit also offered something like this while Eric Wielenberg identifies certain cognitive faculties as the third factor. In my conversation with Humor about metaethics, he explained that most moral realists think our knowledge of moral facts comes by the same faculty, by the same means, as our knowledge of other a priori abstract truths. There's not a separate explanation or a separate faculty for moral facts only. We have accurate moral beliefs because we possess the faculty of reason, which we use for lots of stuff. So this argument and related arguments deserve their own treatment, so even though we've hardly scratched the surface, let's return to the standard moral argument once more. So what's wrong with the moral argument? We've covered a ton of ground, but I want to conclude by summarizing a few key points we've discussed that illuminate why the standard moral argument for God is such an abysmally terrible argument. One, if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. Two, objective moral values exist. 3. Therefore, God exists. So, I would dispute the first premise, that morality is objective only if God exists, for a number of reasons. First, there are robust systems of moral objectivity that make no reference to God. This is something that does not need to be stated for anyone who is at all familiar with the metaethical literature, but it continually shocks those who have relied entirely on apologists for their information on this subject. As Joe Schmid noted in his video, Moral Arguments for God and Analysis, Popular apologetics is seriously out of sync with metaethics here. If you buy mainstream anthologies on metaethics, most won't even mention God and will still contain boatloads of theories accounting for morality in non theistic terms. So there's a striking gap between popular apologetics on metaethics and the actual metaethical literature. End quote. So am I saying apologists are defending a fringe view, therefore it's wrong? No, I'm saying it's a fringe view because they and their audience don't seem to know that it's a fringe view. They think my rejection of the first premise is fringe. But just as a matter of empirical fact, they have it completely backwards, so it's worth correcting. I also think it's worth mentioning the coherence of non-theistic moral realism, because it seems like the first premise of the moral argument, morality is objective only if God exists, is predicated on the impossibility of views like ethical non-naturalism. It's a joke to suggest that defenders of the moral argument actually bother to rule out non-theistic alternatives. If you're going to defend the premise that morality is objective only if God exists, you need to spend some time arguing that non-theistic realism is not an option. But apologists rarely mention moral naturalism or moral non-naturalism, let alone attempt to rule them out in any detail. Apologists are not even on first base here. In case the significance of that point is unclear, the defender of the moral argument needs to systematically rule out every realist option that works independently of God in order to meet the burden they've taken on for themselves when they say, morality is objective only if God exists, or if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. So take the specific meta-ethical views defended by Eric Wielenberg in his book, 
Robust Ethics, The Metaphysics and Epistemology of Godless Normative Realism, or those of Michael Humer in Ethical Intuitionism. If the views of Wielenberg, Humer, and others like them are even possible, then the first premise of the moral argument is false. If there is even one coherent non-theistic option on the table, if it is merely possible that atheists can have objective morals, then it is not true that morality is objective only if God exists. Complaining that, quote, moral Platonism is extravagant or vaguely gesturing at evolutionary debunking arguments doesn't satisfy the burden the defender of the moral argument has saddled himself with. You're defending the moral argument. You need to justify the premises of your argument. If you're going to justify the first claim of the moral argument, then you need to justify the claim that all forms of non-theistic moral realism are impossible. If that sounds like an insane burden that no one could possibly meet, then you're beginning to see the absurdity of the moral argument for theism. Another objection is on the basis of intrinsicality. I think some things are intrinsically good or intrinsically bad, that is, they're good or bad in themselves, without the need for something outside of them to account for their goodness or badness. There's something in the very nature of suffering which accounts for its badness, not some extrinsic relation it has to Yahweh. The explanation lies in the nature of suffering, not the nature of God. If you think some things are intrinsically good, for example, some people say human life is intrinsically valuable, then you are saying that those things are good in themselves, not in virtue of something else, like an extrinsic relation they have to God. Similarly, I think facts about the act of torture account for its badness or wrongness. When you call up to mind the nature of torture, and vividly contemplate the extraordinary pain that's inflicted, the absolute dominance of one human being over another, the radical imbalance of power, the unreliability of the information that's sought, if you gain information at all. And did I mention the extraordinary pain? It becomes clear that those features are enough to make it right or wrong, good or bad. If God commanded us not to torture each other, he did so because of those facts those facts about the victim, the perpetrator, and the nature of torture. And again, if you think that some things are intrinsically good or intrinsically valuable, like human life, then I believe what you're saying is that it's good independently of God. How is it intrinsically valuable, an end in itself, if its value depends entirely on some fact about something else? In that case, it's not valuable in itself. It's only valuable in virtue of a relation it stands in to something else. I don't see how you can consistently maintain that human life is intrinsically valuable and that it only has value in virtue of God granting it value. In a related vein, we can ask whether God had reasons for issuing the moral law he handed down. Either God has reasons, or he does not have reasons. If he has a reason for forbidding torture, say because of the intrinsic features of the act, or because it violates the rights of the victim, or some other possibility, then at least some moral truths are explanatorily prior to God, which means the moral argument fails and you've paved the way for non-theistic moral realism. The only alternative to the option that there is a reason is there is no reason, in which case morality is arbitrary. There's just no reason God commands what he does. But if he did have a reason, which seems likely, then it's clearly that reason that's doing the explanatory heavy lifting. And if that reason, whatever it was, was good enough for God to issue his injunctions, why wouldn't it be good enough for us? So that's roughly the first order Euthyphro dilemma. Pushing the dilemma back to God's nature doesn't help anything, since we can then present a second order dilemma and ask if there's a reason God's moral nature is as it is. Is there any particular reason God's nature is such that he necessarily forbids torture? Or is there no reason at all? The same dilemma just presents itself again. Either there's an underlying reason for God's moral nature, in which case it's that underlying reason that accounts for moral value, or there is no underlying reason, and the theist has not successfully avoided the problem of moral arbitrariness. If there's a reason God's nature is essentially loving, or if there's a reason his command to love one another necessarily flows from his nature, then God is explanatorily redundant. There's a deeper explanation for his moral nature and we should be looking to those reasons to account for the goodness of love. So it's not just that the moral argument is implausible in its deductive form. Even if you made an abductive version of the argument with the premise, if morality is objective, 
then God is the best explanation for its being objective. I would dispute that too, since appealing to God to ground moral values either leaves you looking to deeper reasons or leaves you with moral arbitrariness. God could not be the best explanation of objective moral values. There's a further reason God couldn't be the best explanation, or an explanation at all, of objective moral values. How could God explain objective moral truths any more than he could explain objective logical or mathematical truths? If a mind, or a person, or three persons, are posited to ground logical truths, it seems like we're no longer talking about an objectivist theory. We're talking about a subjectivist theory. In other words, I dispute the idea that God can be the author of objective moral values in the first place. Divine command theory cannot get you objective morality. Because it is a subjectivist theory, it leaves you with the problem of horrible endorsements, where certain actions, like torture, are in fact morally right as long as the appropriate person or group endorses them. It also creates new areas of moral disagreement, since even if God exists and morality is grounded in him, we don't know what he commands. And of course, it's vulnerable to Euthyphro-style dilemmas, which either will lead us to ethical truths independent of God, thus refuting divine command theory, or leave us with nothing more than a morally arbitrary set of rules, backed by force. Finally, there's the Oppian, both end and primitives, objection. Without rehashing all the details, both the moral realist and the divine command theorist are going to have to eventually rely on theoretical primitives. There comes a time when the chain of justification and explanation comes to an end, which means the divine command theorist doesn't have a leg to stand on when they complain about the bruteness or ungroundedness of moral realism. We could also go on the offensive and say that while our theories both end in primitives, the non-theistic alternative does it with less metaphysical baggage and should therefore be preferred on grounds of simplicity. So in light of the Oppian objection, the fact that divine command theory is not an objectivist theory in the first place, the first and second order Euthyphro dilemma, the intrinsicality objection, and the coherence of non-theistic moral realism, like ethical naturalism and non-naturalism, the moral argument is a completely botched argument for God's existence. There's virtually nothing going for the central premise, and quite a lot going against it. The argument's astonishing popularity is mostly due to widespread unfamiliarity with the main subject matter, metaethics. As I've begun to talk more about this argument, some theists have reacted badly to the suggestion that it matters that they're unfamiliar with metaethics. But if you're making the moral argument, you've already started dealing with metaethics, making metaethical claims and so forth. It obviously wouldn't make any sense to say, I want to make the cosmological argument, but I don't want to talk about philosophy. Metaethics is the engine of the moral argument. So, why aren't there more defenders of the moral argument who are well-versed in the subject matter it depends on? After all, there are brilliant theists who defend cosmological arguments, design arguments, people who have advanced the understanding of the various subjects those arguments run on. So, why is it comparatively hard to think of similar cases when it comes to the moral argument? The reason is that once you learn about the subject matter, you realize the argument sucks. That's why most of the defenders of the moral argument are bottom-of-the-barrel pop apologists who don't know anything about metaethics. The worst apologists are the ones who are ignorant of philosophy. So what's Craig's excuse? He's a philosopher, and arguably the most prominent defender of the moral argument. I think the answer can be found in an interview with John D. Martin, who asked him which arguments are the most effective with students. Here's what Craig said. Quote, Interestingly enough, I think the moral argument is the most effective. I personally like the scientific and philosophical arguments, based on science and cosmology, but I find that those don't really move students as much as the moral argument, which says that apart from God, there's no absolute foundation for moral values. Therefore, if you're going to affirm the value of things like tolerance, love, fair play, the rights of women, and so forth, you need to have a transcendent anchor point. You need to have God. I think students are so familiar with the idea that God is dead, therefore everything is relative, that they resonate with that argument when you tell them that apart from God, there are no moral absolutes. So this argument has tremendous appeal to students. It is one to which they respond. Is it just me, or is he saying that he defends the moral argument so frequently because it's effective, and not because he thinks it's a good argument? So with that, thank you for listening. I've been Emerson Green, and I'll see you next time.